Good evening, New Era Church. My name is Hazel Owens, Minister Hazel Owens. I um, am no stranger to New Era, and I'm really delighted and excited to be with you all on this Wednesday in the Word this week, actually for the entire month of March. I'm super excited uh, for what we're going to be sharing this month as you all are moving forward this ministry year. We're going to be moving forward in the month of March on Wednesday in the Word in, our, in the area of our relationships. And so this entire month, we will be talking about relationships of all kinds. And I cannot wait. Can, I'm so excited to um, share with you all. So just to kind of give you a, a backdrop before we jump into things on how this series is going to work. We're going to pay attention to healthy ways in which we can navigate our relationships from marriages to our relationships in our singleness and friendships to um, even, you know, the relationships that have failed and uh, we are needing to recover from. Uh, we're going to explore how to navigate that in a very real uh, practical way with the integration of biblical concepts and therapeutic practices joining hand in hand. And I cannot be more excited. As a, a licensed marriage and family therapist associate here in the state of Indiana who sees couples, individuals, and families. I deal with relationships often in my day-to-day -day work. Also, I'm serving as a associate pastor and lay minister at two churches. So um, it's exciting for me personally to see these two worlds collide in this way. So if you would just join with me in a word of prayer, and we're going to jump right in and get started. Lord, let the words of my mouth and let the meditations of our hearts, God, let them be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are our strength and you are our redeemer. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So to begin tonight, we are going to uh, be talking on the topic of marriages. So as we are moving forward in our relationships, as we are navigating healthy ways to uh, embrace all the things that come up in relationships. We're going to focus on marriages tonight. Um, for the sake of our time together, I am going to have moments where I flip uh, between uh, you all seeing my face and, and me conversing with you all in this virtual space to uh, different slides where I'm going to show some content. You are also welcome to type in the chat um, if you have questions or comments, I will be able to see it there and uh, hopefully be able to address as many of those questions while we are teaching and conversing together. So um, don't be shy about using the chat feature on Facebook. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, our backdrop today for our, our scripture references are going to come from Ephesians 5, verse 21 through 33, and Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses nine through 12. We're gonna approach our topic on marriage today and moving forward in our relationships um, in the area of marriage with the theme of the three-stranded cord that is going to come out of straight out of Ecclesiastes four. And so the goal that we're going to uh, navigate today is looking at Paul's instructions for marriage, in particular, the roles that uh, men and women play, and then also the challenges that we face today towards mutual submission and how we keep God at the center of our marriages and really all of our relationships, to, to be frank. So let's go ahead and dive into the word. Um, if you would, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter five, starting at verse 21. I'm going to share my screen so you can see it and follow along with me. So Ephesians 5, verse 21 it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Then it goes on to say, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her 
by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. So this is Paul writing in to the church of Ephesus here in chapter five. Let's uh, flip over to our second scripture reference, which is going to be Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. And out of this passage, I really want us to focus on a cord of three strands is not easily broken. When we look at Ephesians um, 5 and 21, I want us to really focus in on submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Um, so if you're still hanging in there with me, I know I am talking about uh, some really uh, controversial things in our society today uh, as we're talking about the mission and, and what have you. So I just ask for you to just hang in there with me. OK, so we're going to look at this again from the form of three strands, uh, the first strand being being that of, of God. So I'm going to stop share for just a second and, and chat with you all. If we look at Ephesians chapter five, we started with 21 as our back, verse 21 as our backdrop, but I want us to go back and look at verse one through five. It says, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly beloved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you that must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people, verse four, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving, verse five, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person such as man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. All right, so what are we talking about here? Before we, before Paul even addresses uh, the roles of wife and the roles of the husband to in his letter to the church of Ephesus, all of chapter five, he is um, addressing unity here in the church. So this is the part, um, and even in chapter four, where he's starting to address unity in church. Paul addresses all of this before he really starts to dive into how things should go in, in the household and the roles within it. Here in these first five verses, he's talking about believers being children of light. So before we can mutually submit to one another, there is a submission that each of us have to have when it comes to our relationship with God. We are to be imitators of God. That is, we are to deal with one another in sacrificial love. That's a love that goes beyond self-serving or beyond self-sacrificing service. It's a deep form of love. It's an agape love, an unconditional love. And this love is not something that just comes to us as humans very naturally. This love comes through our relationship with God so that we can then pour that out into our other relationships. So when we talk about 
uh, submit yourselves to one another at a, at a reverence for God, well, you first have to have that relationship at the foundation with God before you can begin to submit to any man or woman, okay? Um, again, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. I will try to address them as, as often as I can. But out of this relationship, being at the foundation with God, we'll also grow in our wisdom. We'll grow in our discernment so that God can lead us to who we need to hook ourselves up with in relationship. This is not saying that we should not talk to unbelievers or anything like that. What this does do is help us to discern what type of relationships we find ourselves entering in. As a couples therapist, I, I tend to find myself sitting with couples who are in great distress for many different things. And um, in some cases, uh, there are times where the couples realize that, man, maybe we should have never gotten together. Maybe this is not for us. Um, maybe we need to, to do a to split or whatever the case may be. And I'm not saying that in these situations that there was no foundation of a relationship with God. But what I am saying is that it is so important to keep God at the center of all of our relationships. In particular, we're talking about marriages tonight. Okay. So I'm going to go back to that, I'm sure, at the end. Strand number two is, and three will be the bride and the groom. So if we keep going into Ephesians 5, what we then see is wives submit yourselves to your, to your own husband as you do unto the Lord. Then down further, um, Paul talks about the husband's form of submission as well. But in verse 21, it says for them both to submit themselves to one another out of reverence for God. So you have your own relationship with God. You start submitting yourself to God. You understand at that point what submission looks like. And now you are hooked up, joining in union with another person through marriage. And Paul is saying, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is a mutual service. This is a mutual meeting of needs. In our society, we have distorted this view of submission into something that is tainted as if um, one person is inferior to the other and you should be like a doormat. <laughs> That's not what Paul is saying here. That is a, a misuse and, a, and an abuse of, of this passage. But again, going back to 21, verse 21, mutual service to one another, okay? Um, yes, uh, someone said both submit um, often is not the case. Exactly. And so that's getting me to my next point. There are some challenges that I believe we face when it comes to mutual submission. Part of that is a misunderstanding of submission. We can thank society, we can thank culture for that, right? Um, again, understanding what biblical submission means uh, is very different from what uh, society has, has uh, tainted us into believing what submission is. The other, another challenge, there's so many, let me just go ahead and say this. There are so many challenges that I believe we face when it comes to this submission piece in our relationships, especially in our marriages that we're not, we don't have enough time tonight to go through them all, but I'm just gonna highlight a few, okay? So we have this misunderstanding of submission and I hope um, I, I tried to make that a little bit clear on what Paul was addressing here to the church of Ephesus. Um, it's a mutual service to one another, a mutual meeting of the needs of one another, and that is birthed out of one's own relationship with God. Then you have past hurts, traumas that have gone unhealed, right? So, so many of us um, are carrying the weight of past experiences that, that were harmful, or traumas that were harmful, or we are walking around with inherited narratives uh, about marriage or about relationships that may not have been our own. There's some generational pattern or generational trauma that has shown us what marriage is or isn't, or some um, 
view or narrative that we have been uh, constructed by what we what we see in society or in media or in culture, right? And then sometimes it's our own experiences in previous relationships or just previous experiences in, in general that has caused some lasting emotional traumas. And when those things go unhealed or unaddressed, that can get in the way of this mutual service to one another, this mutual meeting of one another's needs. Unspoken or unrealistic expectations is another one, okay? I sit with couples uh, day to day, and um, oftentimes I'm asking, what is your expectations in this marriage? What is your expectation of your husband? What is your expectation of your wife? And as things start to get revealed, chances are one of the partners are shocked. I had no idea that you expected this. I had no idea this is what you wanted. And so when we have these unspoken or unrealistic expectations, we, we operate out of assumption. And we're assuming that the person knows what we need. We're assuming that our partner can read our mind and that is just not the case. And so part of this is leads us to this other challenge which is ineffective communication. Um, I oftentimes have couples come to me saying, hey, you know, we are having a hard time with communicating. And uh, they want to work on their communication, which is great. And when, when I get that in the therapy room, the question that I often uh, ask is, well, how are we communicating? And, and I get to explore that with the couple and their current communication patterns. And oftentimes the ineffective communication, it is a byproduct of something that is deeper, that is um, more painful that the couple is experiencing. And chances are it is a misalignment in meeting needs, okay? So first thing, we gotta check our relationship with God first. What is that submission like? How are, how have we grown in that relationship? In what ways have we uh, tried to model ourselves to be imitators of Christ? In what ways have we grown deeper and not only in our love for God, but receiving that love, right? So that it can be reflected in our other relationships. And tonight we're talking about marriage, right? Ineffective communication uh, is, is one big challenge to this mutual service, this meeting needs of one another. So here's some keys to communication that I often uh, address with couples. Honesty, transparency, and vulnerability. Let's look at uh, Ephesians 4. I know we're, we're kind of hanging in Ephesians a lot tonight, but let's look at Ephesians 4, verse 15. Again, this is Paul's portion of the letter where he is talking to, uh, writing to the church of Ephesus about their unity with one another. Um, so Ephesians 4, verse 15 says, instead speaking the truth in love, we, we will in all things grow up into him who is head, that is Christ. So when we talk about honesty, we have to speak truth, but we have to speak it in love. Oftentimes we are bent on truth with no regard of how that comes out, with no regard of how the truth that we share can impact someone else. That doesn't mean be dishonest, right? You are to speak truth, but where's the love piece? So it's truth in love, okay? Um, verse 25 in, in the same chapter, chapter four, uh, it says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor for we are all members of one body. And then it goes on, in, in your anger, do not sin. What I love about that is, it doesn't, it, Paul is not saying don't feel angry. Anger is a very valid human emotion. But what he's addressing is don't sin with the anger. 
You can speak honestly. You can speak truthfully. And you ought to. You shouldn't uh, put on falsehoods to your neighbor or your spouse. Speak truthfully. Speak honestly. But then are you doing it in love? What is the, the motive that you have for your truth speaking? What, what is it that you're trying to gain? Um, oftentimes I'll hear a couple say, well, that wasn't my intention. You know that that wasn't my intention. So I don't understand why you're so upset. You know that that, that wasn't my intention with no regard to the impact. And so when we are thinking about only our intentions, when we speak certain things, without considering the impact that it has, we can run the risk of doing harm. This is why the truth and love, the love piece is so important because the love piece will have you think about the impact that you want to make first with the truth that you need to speak to your partner, okay? So that's the honesty piece of effective communication. We have to be honest with one another. And in order for you to be honest with your partner, you first have to be honest with yourself. Oftentimes, um, we, we're, not, we're deceiving our own self about what it is that we feel and what it is that we think. And we give a falsehood and not, not even realize it. So we present ourselves one way to our partner. We, we say one thing to our partner, but we really mean something else. Or we are withholding what we really feel out of fear of something, fear of hurting the other person, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment. Again, this ties back to those past hurts and past traumas that can get in the way of having this mutual service with one another. Okay, are y'all still with me? Um, the next key to effective communication will be transparency. This ties into the last key that I'm gonna, gonna discuss, vulnerability. And these are the hard ones, right? Because again, it, it forces you to be honest with yourself first and then honest and transparent with your partner. Transparency can, for, for many couples, bring about a level of security in the relationship. It takes the guesswork out. <laughs> and oftentimes uh, when there's guesswork to be done, then we're now operating in assumptions. And based off of these assumptions, uh, we then have a response or reaction to whatever is being presented, right? And so I tell my couples all the time, less assuming, more asking. Ask for clarity. And then the other partner has to be transparent. Be honest, be transparent. And then the last piece here, be vulnerable. This one is really a challenge, especially if your vulnerability has been used against you has it been nurtured well? Has it been cared for well? If there is um, a past history of um, conflict and, and uh, tension and abuse in some way, it is very hard to be vulnerable. I understand that. Some of this, what, what I'm saying is very much easier said than done. I'm fully aware of that. But vulnerability is the, the, the key that can help strengthen bonds of love with one another. Um, in uh, the Gottman uh, Couples Method, we talk about love maps. Um, it is exploring and being curious with one another, but being vulnerable as well. To be honest about what it is that you need, to be honest about what it is that you're feeling, to be able to even speak the truth in love, it requires you to be vulnerable. And vulnerability can be a scary thing. And when it's scary and when it's tough, it becomes, it, it, it tends to run the risk of um, forcing you to have ineffective communication, which can be a barrier to this mutual service and meeting of each other's needs. So 
when we are being vulnerable, when we are communicating, when we're being honest, when we're being transparent, one of the things I often tell my couples is to remember the three T's. And I'm going to uh, switch my screen here so that you guys can see this. Yes, transparency leads to vulnerability, but can be scary. It absolutely can. And so this is where you get to um, explore within yourself. Why is this scary for me? Ask yourself that question. What makes my vulnerability scary? The last time that I was vulnerable, what happened? What do I fear will happen again? What evidence do I have that makes that true? Right. So you got to really interrogate those emotions that come up that will block you from being vulnerable with your partner. Because if you can be and vulnerable with God, let me just put that out there, too, is the more vulnerable and the more honest and the more transparent you are, even with God. The hope is, is that that should lead you to be able to do that with your partner. But your partner have to be a safe place for you to land. And you have to be a safe place for your partner to land. And so we got to ask ourselves, what gets in the way of us being honest? What gets in the way of us being transparent? What gets in the way of us being vulnerable? What gets in the way of us um, being able to grow in this mutual submission, this mutual service, this mutual meeting of needs for one another? Okay. When we are communicating, remember the three T's. Uh, um, tone, tact, and timing. Ask yourself, how's my tone? How am I going to approach this conversation? What's my tone like? Do I need to self-soothe whatever emotions I'm feeling before I have this conversation so that I am thinking of the impact first before the truth telling, right? This is especially important when we're having big conversations that, that are going to um, arise in big emotions, right, that may be a little difficult to handle. So how's my tone? Do I need to self-soothe before having this conversation? The next T is tact. Are my words tactful? Am I, uh, are my words, as the scripture says, sweet like honey? right? Um, not to be passive aggressive, not to um, water down um, your, your own truth and, and what you are feeling, right? But to make sure that you are speaking in such a way that the person um, that, you're, that you're talking to, your partner, doesn't, uh, it, it lowers the risk of creating some defenses, where you're not approaching your partner with contempt or criticism or um, any, anything like that. What, what is your, how tactful are your words? And we're going to get into uh, criticism here in just a moment. Am I approaching this conversation with a harsh startup? Something I'm going to explain here in just a second. Or am I being gentle? Truth and love, right? We got to remember the love piece. And then the last T, timing. Is this even the right time to have this discussion? Am I in the right place, in the right frame of mind to have this discussion? Have I talked to God about it first before bringing this to my partner? Um, am I considering my partner? What's going on with, with them? Is this a good time for them? Do I have capacity uh, in this moment to have this type of conversation and um, does my partner have capacity? Do I need to check in with my partner first before uh, bringing this to them? Am I considering what's on our plate? Am I considering what's happening in the household before I have this type of conversation? So remember the three T's when you're communicating. Tone, tact, timing. It's important. And then the, in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 29, Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
And so when you're talking and communicating with your partner, are you building each other up? Even with the harsh truth, even with the um, uh, harsh honesty, are you building each other up? Mm. Timing is a hard one. Is there ever a right time for hard conversations if they're priority topics? Well, here's the thing. If it's a priority, I believe you make time for it, right? So when I, when I think about timing, uh, when it comes to uh, harsh topics or, or hard topics, whatever it is, um, are you being considerate or mindful of what is happening, not only within yourself, but with the other person? Is this the right time? If it is something that needs to be discussed and it needs to be a priority, then you and your partner have to make it a priority. And so one of the things that we're going to talk about in some of the takeaways is scheduling conversations, right? So I understand life gets busy. You got work and um, kids probably and schedules and Everybody is on the go. We don't know half the time what's happening with this pandemic. And we are just, you know, kind of all over the place. And sometimes we can miss each other, right? And so we have to make your relationship a priority, your marriage a priority. And that includes having the conversations that are probably difficult to have. So if it feels like the timing is, is never good, then you schedule the timing. You actually set up a, a time with your partner to have the conversation. Just like you would schedule date night, schedule these uh, difficult conversations, whether it's about the budget, whether it's about uh, some uh, distress or hurt feelings, whether it's about something with one of the kids, whether it's about uh, a family member who is ill, whether it's about um, something going on with you personally and that you know it's going to take some time to, to fully discuss, you got to schedule it if you are feeling like timing is always an issue. So we make time for the things that we really want. And if it is hard for you to, to find that time, then you got to ask yourself, well, what other emotions are present that is getting in the way of me spending time on this particular thing that is bothering me <laughs> that I need to share with my partner? The same, it goes back, let's go on back to uh, keeping God at the center. Are you making time to spend with God and in prayer about this, whatever the, the this is? And so um, how are you prioritizing your time with God first? Because again, before we can mutually submit to one another, that relationship with our heavenly father, our heavenly mother has to be a priority too. So I hope that was uh, helpful. Um, all right. So last little piece here um, under the uh, communication, uh, repairing from conflict, right? And this could be a, a really uh, sticky one. In Ephesians 4, uh, verse 26, again, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Uh, now, let me just pause here for just a second. Because I, I think for a lot of married couples, uh, that scripture, that particular part of passage is used to tell couples, don't go to bed angry. Here's the thing. You can talk about something and have a resolve and still feel a little anger at the time you go to bed. Okay. Um, so some couples, because they have this belief that we shouldn't go to bed angry, they will exhaust so many hours talking through a situation that just won't get resolved in that time, all for fear of going to bed angry. And so through this repairing uh, of conflict, um, hopefully you, you'll learn some, some tips and tricks on how to pause a conversation without having contempt for one another so that you can go to bed just a little bit more peaceful, but you still may feel a little upset and that is okay. There's ways that you can um, process some of those emotions on your own and some self-soothing mechanisms that are healthy so that you get good night's sleep. And then you pick up that conversation again at the time that you all scheduled to have, to continue that conversation. We'll talk about that a little bit more here, here in just a second. 
okay? Uh, Ephesians 4, 32, uh, Paul, Paul writes and says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Be kind and compassionate with one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I've gone to uh, several weddings. I, I, I've been a part of many weddings. I've been a bridesmaid more times than I ever want to admit. <laughs> and oftentimes um, at the wedding ceremony, the Ecclesiastes uh, passage that we're using today, the three-stranded cord that's uh, spoken, but also the love passage out of uh, Corinthians where it says love is patient, love is kind, love is this, love is that, right? And we say this because it sounds so beautiful, but let's just go there for, for just a second. Let, let, me, let me just flip to it real quick because there's something about that passage in, um, in Corinthians. Give me one second, let me, let me find it here. that I think we, we, tend to, we tend to miss. We, we say this um, and, and we love it because it's beautiful, right? But we miss uh, some of the things that, that Paul is saying even to the church of, of Corinth um, about this whole love piece. Here it is. Um, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. The word here is is that we need to focus on. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I have so many couples who will store up the wrongs and use them as arsenal for conversations later, right? But love doesn't do that. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Again, truth and love. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Okay? So if we are going to be kind and compassionate with one another. If we are going to forgive one another just as Christ forgave us, then we ought to love one another as Christ loved us. This is easier said than done. This is why God has to be at the center. This is why your own individual relationship with God has to be at the foundation before you enter any other relationship, especially as you are entering marriage. God has to be at the center so that you can love one another well, so that you can serve one another well, a mutual servitude meeting the needs of one another, okay? So how do we repair from conflict? Um, we got a few more minutes here. I'm going to go to this slide so I can show you this graphic. Um, and I'm going to explain where this came from. There is a therapy uh, model uh, created by John and Julie Gottman, Gottman's Couples Method. And one of the things that they talk about are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And, and, and those who are, if you've been in any kind of relationship, you will probably uh, find a little bit of resonance as I go through this. So what you see here is criticism, content, defensiveness, and, and stonewalling. Those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. On the other side of this graphic are the anecdotes to avoid that particular horseman of the apocalypse, okay? So when you're communicating with your partner and there's some conflict that arise, oftentimes here comes criticism where you're verbally attacking one another's personality or character, right? Um, oftentimes I see this as a finger pointing, you always and you never. You always do this and you never do that. That's a criticism. And so to avoid 
the apocalypse happening where you're now just bumping heads. Nobody's hearing one another. You use a gentle startup. Talk about your feelings using I statements and express a positive need. I felt blank when blank happened. I hope in the future that this could happen or I need blank next time. I feel statements, not you always, you never, okay? Contempt, attacking the sense of self uh, with an intent to insult or abuse, right? So again, if we have experienced any challenge to mutual service of one another, to uh, meeting one another's needs, whether it's through past hurts, past experiences, um, un unresolved uh, or unspoken expectations or, or any other challenge that comes up, sometimes in conflict, here comes contempt, where we start to attack our partner and we, we want to hurt them like they hurt us. And so the antidote is build a culture of appreciation. Remind yourself of your partner's positive qualities and find gratitude for positive actions. Sometimes this is easy. All of this is easier said than done. This culture of appreciation will help to repair trust. When we... Um, we talk about gratitude often, I believe in one of the passages that we um, read in Ephesians, it, it talked about uh, uh, speaking with thanksgiving, right? So expressing gratitude is important. Sometimes, often, defensiveness will come up, whether in yourself or whether in your partner or both of you, where there's a victimizing oneself to ward off a perceived attack or reverse the blame. So the antidote to that is to take responsibility, accept your partner's perspective, often offer an apology for any wrongdoing. This is where we listen. We put ourselves in the seat of humility and we listen to understand perspective, not to get a win, not to prove a point, not to win someone over, to understand perspective, even if we don't agree with it. Understanding your partner's perspective doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but when you understand one's perspective, then here comes compassion and empathy. And using a gentle startup, you are able to communicate with one another about your need. The last um, uh, horseman is stonewalling. This is at the, at the peak of the conflict where one person completely withdraws and they avoid any more conflict, they're pretty much done, they have shut down, um, or they storm out or walk away. And so whenever that feeling starts to come up, it is so important for some physiological self-soothing. Take a break, breathe, spend some time doing something soothing that is healthy and distracting. Pause on the discussion. Go in prayer, read scripture, uh, journal what you're feeling, do something to recenter yourself. And when you both are at a place where you can pick the conversation back up and you can start with a gentle startup, then do so, okay? So again, there's so much information uh, to share on just navigating uh, healthy ways of uh, moving forward and, and winning in your relationships that we just don't have time for, especially on this topic of marriage. There's a lot out there, um, a lot that I would want to want to dive into, uh, but for the sake of time, we can't. Um, real quick, let's go back to Ecclesiastes. A three-stranded three cord is not easily broken. That does not mean that the cord won't get tired. It doesn't mean that the cord won't get stretched. It doesn't mean that 
the cord won't have things trying to pick away at it. But if God is at the center and you and your partner are the other strands and they're interwoven together, it is not easily broken. And, and if it does tend to wear or tear, God is at the center to be able to mend it back together. And so here's some practical takeaways that um, I will want you all to, to just practice over this uh, next week and, and, and beyond. Spend some time individually and together in prayer. As you pray, ask God to reveal to you, to reveal to you, you and your spouse ways that you can increase mutual submission, mutual service to one another, ways in which you can uh, meet one another's needs. And ask God to help you to communicate that honestly, transparently, vulnerably. Pay attention to the barriers that get in the way and seek guidance through scripture, through your relationship with God to work through those barriers. And sometimes God may send you to a third party, that of a marriage counselor who's trained in, in human behavior and have experience with this, that of your pastor or some other uh, couple that you can come alongside with, and they can pour into you some biblical wisdom, okay? So spend to get time individually in prayer and make sure that that is happening together with one another. God has to be at the center. And then schedule time to have big conversations. You and your partner know what the big conversations are. I don't need to spell that out. But when you schedule it, set a timer for one hour. As emotion starts to rise and get flooded, it literally impacts your hearing. And if there's a history of contention in the relationship, when our emotions are flooded, we're not really hearing what the, our partner is saying. We're making assumptions based off of uh, past experiences and we're perceiving things that are going to be said. We're perceiving actions that are going to be done. And so it's important to frame the conversation at a time that you both can agree on and schedule it for one hour. When the timer goes off, the conversation has to stop. So you pray before you have that conversation together, have the conversation, close it with prayer then go self-soothe if you need to. Practice the antidotes to the four horsemen. A gentle startup. Let me go back to that. Culture of appreciation. Taking responsibility. Physiological self-soothing. Okay? And notice I started with God first because you're going to need help from the Holy Spirit to reveal those things and help from the Holy Spirit to uh, help you to love in the way that God wants us to love one another. And then last thing, I'll flip back. Remember the three T's, tone, tact, timing. How's my tone? Are my words tactful? Is this the right time? Do I have capacity? Is this a good time for my husband? And if timing becomes an issue, make it a priority by scheduling it, okay? We make time for the things we want. So we have to make a priority, all right? Um, I will be with you all every Wednesday this month to talk about relationships. Welcome to the Relationship Series. I'm excited to, to journey with you all. 
Here's my contact information if there are questions that you have. Um, on the fifth Wednesday, we will have a panel where we will dive into uh, some of these uh, topics that we're discussing over the next four weeks just a little bit deeper. And so I hope that you uh, tune in every week and um, please feel free to email me any questions you may have um, on any of the topics that we have and I will do my best to uh, respond um, immediately and hopefully be um, a good resource for you. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word, Lord. Thank you for the ways in which that you have woven us together and knitted us together. And that from the beginning of time, um, you had a plan for us and you had a plan for our relationships. And so God, we just thank you for that. Lord, I just uh, lift up marriages to you right now in the name of Jesus. Um, God, a marriage is, is a reflection of your love for, for your bride, your bride being the church, us. And there's a mystery to that love. And sometimes marriage can feel like a mystery but just like uh, the enemy tried to disrupt your plan for redemption, uh, the enemy wants to attack marriages. And so God, right now, I just uh, pray that you bind up any threat, any um, dagger that the enemy may try to throw um, at, at your your um your sons and daughters who are married, Lord, that they um, have what it takes to withstand those tactics, Lord. And I just pray that um those who are listening, those who may go back and listen, that um, they not only grow in their mutual service to one another, but God, that most importantly, that they grow in their um, submission and in their relationship with you. And so God, I just ask for you to heal, to uh, deliver, to set free, God. And I believe that it is done and I believe it so. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.